Wonderful. Well, thank you everyone um, for joining us this morning. I know, you know, last night was late for some, including myself. Um, so thank you for making the effort to be here this morning. And I'm sure we'll have a few more folks um, coming in as we start. Um, so today we're going to talk about automating index selection using constrained programming. So I'm Lucas, um, in the first row there is my colleague Philip, and we're going to be talking about how you can essentially figure out which indexes to create for your table, but not do it manually like most of us do today probably, but rather use a model and an automated approach to do so. Generally, you know, we have kind of three things we'll talk about today. We'll first give you some background on index selection, like the index selection problem, what that means, um, and kind of just so you have some context on what we're talking about. Um, then Philippe is going to take over and talk about a constrained programming model for index selection. Um, and then last, um, I'll talk again about utilizing that model to actually make use of it on an actual database um, and kind of showing you how you can get to essentially saying these are the missing indexes for this query workload as measured by PGSAT statements. Now, some extra background before I jump in. Um, at PG Analyze, we thought about this problem of index selection for roughly two years. Um, this is, I would say, the third iteration of us looking at this. Um, I'm sure it's not the last one, right? So this is not intended to be the solution. Um, it is a solution, and I think uh, my goal is that you find this interesting. You ask questions about, you know, how does this work? Is this useful? Um, maybe have ideas on how to improve it, um, and so that, that we as a community can essentially do more things, make Postgres smarter um, in terms of uh, index selection in particular. Now some background on what index selection means. Um, so generally the index selection problem is about wanting to select a certain set of indexes to create on a table whilst making sure that they make the queries fast, right? That's why we kind of want indexes in the first place. Um, we've made the exception of unique indexes, I guess. Um, and then keeping write overhead low. So you know we don't just want to index everything most of the time because that actually adds a lot of overhead. And so that's really the challenge here is these you know, two opposing problems, essentially, or these opposing goals. Um, really, the question we're asking is, which indexes should we select? So again, when we say selection, we don't mean a new index method. Um, we're just talking, for example, regular B-tree indexes. It's just a question of which type of create index command to run. Now, this is not a new problem. This has been worked on for a while. Um, the first paper I think we found was from 1971, um, talking about you know, a variant of this problem. Um, more recently, um, there was a good comparison of different index selection algorithms um, done by a research group in Germany in 2020. And there's also Dexter, which some of you might be familiar with, which also tries to solve that problem. Um, and really interestingly enough, it was also referenced in that you know, last paper there at the end, um, where they kind of compared Dexter against other approaches. Um, and so I think you know, this is, again, not a new problem, um, but I think we have a, you know, a new way of looking at this, I would say. Now, yesterday, um, you know, in, in nothing against the lightning talk speaker, but I found it funny that there was an example of just indexing everything yesterday, um, because I think that's one thing that some people do. And for you know that lightning talk yesterday, it actually made a lot of sense because they essentially have a very variable workload and they don't know their customers' queries; it's not predictable. And so their strategy was to literally index everything. Right. So this is one way of solving index selection. The way that most of us probably solve it today, I imagine, is that you essentially pick some indexes that seem right, right? You might do this with informed based on you knowing the application or you ran into a problem in production. Um, this is one of our own tables for our application, um, which you know we have like nine indexes, 10 indexes. Um, these were not created automatically. These were created by intuition. Um, and this is a small table, so it's probably fine. Um, but it is you know, not. Like it's hard to scale that, right? Like it's hard to actually have that be predictable and apply it to hundreds of databases. Now, in Postgres, we have HypoPG. I'm actually curious um, who knows HypoPG in the room? Like, quick show of hands. Maybe half, less than half the people. So, HypoPG, if you don't know it, essentially is an extension for Postgres that lets you create a hypothetical index. So, you don't actually have to create the index, you just say, this is my create index statement. And then it inserts kind of a phantom index into the Postgres catalog, or kind of has an override table, rather. Um, and then when you do an explain on a query, it pretends that index exists. And so it lets you ask the question, what would be the cost of this query if this index existed without having to create it so it's much faster? Um, now, if you want to solve index selection, you could literally just, for all your queries, figure out which indexes could you possibly create then run each of these possible indexes through HyperPG, and then just 
take the lowest cost, right? Take the best performing index. So Hyper-VG is a very important ingredient to this whole problem because it lets us avoid actually creating every possible index. But the challenge with Hyper-VG, and I, I was talking with somebody yesterday about this, which is, you know, why doesn't Hyper-VG solve this essentially, right? Why are we even talking about this? Um, and I think Hyper-VG looks at a single query for the most part, and so it doesn't really help you think about a workload as a whole. Um, it also doesn't really think about the trade-offs, right? So like the, the whole aspect of what are too many indexes, um, which like multi-column indexes are the right choice, um, Hyper-VG doesn't really help you with that. And so when you know, we think about this index selection problem visually, we kind of think about this you know, to go from on the left side here, the query workload, um, which is you know, like select statements, for example, um, to the selected indexes on the right, which would be you know, index this field or do this multi-column index. And so the way we do this, roughly, is that we go from a query workload to which possible indexes could exist. Then from that, we try to estimate the performance improvement for each query, as well as the overhead for each index. With those two ingredients, we then essentially run that index selection um, to find out you know, what are the actual indexes that we want to keep. Now, in the research literature, this is a very common approach, and we've picked the same approach, which is to use costs as a way to estimate performance improvements. Right? I'm sure many of you know if you run explain on the query, you get the cost. If you do explain analyze, or just run the query, rather, um, you get runtime. Runtime is often not the same as cost, right? Um, but it's much more expensive to actually run the query than to just get the planner cost. And so when we say performance improvement, we mean a lower planner cost estimate um, because they're cheap to calculate. Um, the second thing we do, and this might be a bit more you know, different than what's in the literature, is that we actually think of scans, not of queries. And so when we say scans, we mean index scan using this index on this table, you know, filter condition this, uh, like um, join clause this and this. So it's kind of trying to simplify it so that we think about tables, not whole queries, um, because that way we can actually explain what's going on. And so what we're doing is, for each of these tables and for each of these scans, get the sequential scan cost, right? How expensive is it to just read the table? Um, get the existing indexes and their costs, and then get the possible indexes and their costs. Now, let me give you another example of you know, why we care about scans versus queries. Um, this is the next best query I picked just you know, from our database. It's not the most complex query we have, but it's hard to reason about. There's like four different tables in there. There's some things going on. And so why we think about scans is because it lets us say, well, on the database's table, we're looking for a particular server ID and a particular ID that's not hidden. Right? And so it kind of lets us like, reason about the queries in a way that's actually easy to understand. And I feel like oftentimes when you talk with an experienced person that, you know, how are they indexing Postgres, they will have a mental model like this. Right? They will look at the tables in the query, they'll look at the explain plan, they'll say, right now that's a, you know, an index count on this. How do we turn that into a more efficient index count, for example? Now, the second ingredient here is to estimate the overhead for each index. So again, historically, what most of the literature has looked at is using storage size. And so storage size, you can calculate for a hypothetical index with Hyper-PG. Um, and it just you know, makes, makes up something, essentially, um, which works reasonably well. Um, but oftentimes today in the cloud, what we found is that IOs are actually more you know, expensive and problematic than storage space. And so for us, you know, we kind of wanted to say, how do we move from just storage size to something that talks more about activity? And so what we've um, termed index write overhead um, as a metric, essentially. An index write overhead is an estimate. This is not a precise measurement necessarily. Um, but it's the estimated size of an index write in bytes um, divided by the, the size of the table row um, based on index definition. And so what that means is if you have a very wide index definition, index write overhead will be higher. If you have you know, just a small single column index, index write overhead will be smaller. And you could multiply this by the table writes um, per minute as well to kind of scale that um, for more busy tables, right? Because like if you're writing every minute a lot, that's going to be more expensive than if you write once a day. Now, let's um, talk about how we can you know, actually put this into a mathematical model. Um, we'll take a moment just to switch the microphone, but Philippe is going to take over and talk about constraint programming model.
So uh, I'll uh, talk about how we use constraint programming to solve the problem that uh, Lucas introduced. OK. Uh, now, first, optimization uh, is about finding good solutions to problems. And typically, when we solve optimization problems, or what my, most of you are probably used, for, uh, used to, uh, is that you'll have a heuristic, so essentially a strategy that you're going to follow to get a solution that is suitable for your needs for a problem. Uh, it's a good way to work, but there are different methods, uh, more sophisticated, that allow you to do something similar to this, uh, but in a way where uh, you're allowed to explore um, um, a wider variety of solutions. Okay, uh, so here I'm talking about exact methods such as uh, mixed integer programming. Maybe a few of you are familiar with that. Uh, there's constraint programming, there's uh, SAT solvers, there's really a bunch of stuff. Um, but here in our case, we've chosen to approach this problem using uh, constraint programming or CP. And all of these exact methods work in a similar way where you're going to have uh, the data, so the scan costs and all that stuff. Uh, and then you're going to have the problem, so the problem definition, so the things that you want to make happen uh, on that data to have a solution. You'll take these two things, the problem and the data, you'll mash that into a model. Uh, and then this is where the work, your work ends, okay? Uh, the model will be sent to a solver, and the solver will look at the, the model, the problem definition, and the data, and it was going to give you a solution uh, at the other end. Okay, now in practice, how this works is when we uh, define the different rules that we, are, that we want to follow to find a solution, we're going to have a mathematical expression like this, or actually a bunch of different mathematical expressions. And when we put that into a model, what we're actually doing is we're using a library or a framework to code that. And this is the code that the solver is going to understand. So moving from the mathematical, exp mathematical expression that's on paper all the way up to the uh, solution that the solver gives you back, okay, uh, goes through this uh, middle step where we have to uh, code the thing uh, in the library. Um, now just to talk about the model at a higher level view, okay. Uh, so a model is made of three main things. Uh, first, we have the variables. Okay, these are the, the things that we're looking for. The solution that, was, that we're looking for is an assignment of values over the variables. Uh, now, we're not allowed to assign any value to any variables. Okay, there are some constraints or some rules we have to follow. Okay, so these are the constraints of the problem. Uh, and there may be many solutions, okay, but depending on what the, our goal is or what our goals are, our objectives are, which is the same thing, uh, some solutions might be preferable than others, okay? So this is the objective component of the model. So these are the three main uh, components of the model. It's a declarative model, okay? So you just state the things that you want, and the solver is going to take this statement of a problem and the data and, and give you a solution, okay? Now, the solution that the solver gives you is an assignment of values over the variables that is valid with respect to the constraints and that maximizes or minimizes an objective or objectives, depending uh, if you have one or many. Um, and what's interesting with exact methods, and this is why they're called exact methods, is that the solution that the solver gives you sometimes can be proven to be optimal, meaning that the solver not only gives you a solution, but it tells you, uh, this is the solution that I found, and I have a proof that there does not exist a solution that is better than this, okay? And sometimes the solver, well, obviously this takes a lot of time for big instances or for big problems, but um, sometimes the solver is able to give you a solution and tell you, well, uh, this might not be the best solution, uh, but it's this close to the best possible theoretical solution. So these kinds of approaches allow us to gain more information on the, on the value of a solution or the quality of a solution uh, when we get that from the solver over you know, simpler methods such as, as uh, heuristics. So in our case of the index selection model, uh, the variables are the indexes that we're trying to select. So we have a set of indexes, and we want to know which of these indexes we're going to be selecting in the solution. Okay, so these are the variables. This is the thing that we're trying to find. Uh, now the constraints are going to be user-defined rules. Okay, so the user is going to say something like, uh, I don't want a solution that uses more than five indexes. Okay, so this is one of the rule or one of the constraints that the model has to follow. Um, and the objectives are, again, defined by the user. So the user can say, well, I want to minimize the sum of the costs uh, of the scans in the solution, and this is what the solver is going to optimize on. Um, so the index selection model takes uh, uh, on the left the scans and the indexes, which is the data, and on the right it takes the goals and the rules, which is the problem definition or the problem. Uh, 
puts that into a model, gives that to a solver, and then we get a solution back. Okay. Now the solution, the, the example I'll, I'll be using uh, in the next few slides is to select the uh, indexes that minimize the costs and the index write overhead. So now we have two goals. We want to minimize both the costs and the uh, index write overhead. Um, when we have a problem that has many goals, okay, there's, a, uh, there's an issue with that. If we have a single goal, things are easy. You want to minimize the cost, uh, that's cool. Just use a bunch of indexes and you'll get very good cost. Uh, you want to minimize the index write overhead, that's cool. Just use as little uh, indexes as possible and you'll have an index write overhead that's very small. The problem we have these two goals at the same time, okay, you want to minimize the costs and the index write overhead. Well, you know, minimizing the costs pulls, you know, the solution in one direction. Minimizing the index write overhead pulls the, direction, the uh, solution in the other direction. So you have a conflict. So there's kind of a tension between these two goals. Uh, and this tension has to be resolved somehow, okay? Uh, now this is called multi-objective optimization. It's a field of study that's, uh, uh, that's very vast. So I'm just going to talk about different ways of solving this tension between uh, various goals. And of course, there's a lot of uh, uh, approaches and different philosophies on how this should be resolved, but it's really, in general, problem-specific. Depending on what you're trying to achieve, you're going to use one method or another. Um, in all cases, what we want to end up with is solving one, one objective or one objective at a time. Uh, so there's, for example, the weighted sum method, where you have, a, you have your goals or your objectives. Uh, you put them all into one big objective. So you just sum up all of their values. Uh, and then you weight them uh, depending on how, you, how much you care about each goal. The problem with that is that finding good weights that are going to give you reliable solutions, uh, no matter which type of data you're trying to solve the problem on, is very complicated. So this is not a very good approach in our case. Uh, then there's the epsilon constraint method, where what you're going to do is you're going to solve one objective at a time, and you'll put the other objectives as constraints on the problem. And this allows you to plot essentially a trade-off between the different objectives. So we'll have a curve and you can see, well, if I want this objective at this value, this is what I get uh, for the other objectives. So you can really see the trade-offs between the different uh, uh, objectives that you, that you have. Uh, the problem with that method is that when you have more than two, three, four objectives, now how do you view a four-dimensional trade-off between the objectives? It's beca it becomes very complicated. Uh, and also, uh, for every point on the plot, that you draw, it's one optimization problem that you solve, which is very expensive. So in our case, it's not a very good approach. Um, now, what we went with is the hierarchical optimization method. And I won't talk about the lexical graphic method because it's very similar. So you'll see in the next slide uh, how this works. The first thing we do is that we sort the goals by preference, okay? So you're going to say, well, I have three goals. Uh, the goal I care the most about is this one. Then the second goal I care the most about is this one and so on. And then you rank the goal by uh, the goals by order of preference. So in our case, we'll say for the example, we'll say that minimizing the costs is the thing we care the most about, and minimizing the index right overhead is the thing we care the least about. So first, we're going to minimize the cost without any regard for the index right overhead. Okay. So we'll get a solution that has the best possible costs for the problem. Then what we'll do is we'll add a rule to the model, so a constraint, a rule or constraint, the same thing, saying that. For all subsequent solutions, okay, the sum of the costs of the scans cannot be worse than what we found in the first step. So now you know that when you are going to solve the problem for subsequent goals, okay, you're not going to impede on the solutions that you found previously. So you're just always going to improve on that. Uh, and once you've added this new rule, the second goal will be to minimize the index right overhead. And this will tell you, you know, what's the uh, best cost you can get for the lowest uh, uh, index right overhead. The problem with that is, is that it's not very uh, flexible. So what we can do, okay, you can uh, choose for every goal a parameter of strictness. And what that means is that when you add, so when you find a solution for the goal and you add that solution as a rule to the model, you're allowed to say, well, uh, this is not an absolute rule. You're allowed to deviate a little bit from the value that you found. And this allows a wider, wider range of solutions, and you can get better trade-offs in this way. So essentially, this method allows you to say something like, uh, here's the data. I want to minimize the costs, and I want to minimize the index right overhead. I don't know what the best costs are, but I know I'll be happy with costs that are 95% as good as the best possible costs. 
uh, give me the selection of indexes that gives me these costs, uh, or in that small range of costs, for the lowest possible index right overhead. So it allows you to be much more flexible in the way that you define your needs uh, for the solver, and the solver is able to use that uh, and give you solutions that offer uh, good trade-offs between the different goals. Um, so an example I've shown uh, minimizing the scan costs and minimizing the index right overhead, but there's a bunch of different goals you can use. Okay, you could, for example, minimize the worst cost. So if you have uh, a workload that um, can get bad at times because there's a lot of load on the database, okay, if you, can, if you minimize the worst cost, uh, you might lose some efficiency overall, but uh, in the worst times, uh, the performance is likely to be better than if you simply minimize the, the, the sum of all the, the scan costs. Uh, you can minim minimize the number of indexes used, so you can do pretty much anything you, li you like. You can also consider the impact. So right now, we've only talked about uh, scan costs, but there's also, also a scan frequency. So the impact actually is a metric that measures a combination of the scan cost and the scan frequency. So you might be more interested to mi minimize the impact rather than simply the costs. Uh, you can target specific scans. So maybe there's a scan that you know you care a lot about. So you're allowed to say, well, I want to minimize the cost of this specific scan as the first goal. And then you go on, you add the other goals uh, uh, to the rest of the list of goals. And there's more. So essentially, uh, there's no real limit to the things you can express. Okay, so if you have uh, uh, a use case that is very particular to you, and if you have uh, a performance metric, if you have a metric that you care about, and if you're able to put a number or some, on something that you care about, it can be optimized. Okay, so any kind of goal can be created uh, specific to a metric that you care, as long as you're able to put a number on that metric. You can put a number of, on it, it can be optimized. Now, there are more uh, things you can add to the model. Uh, you can have, for example, uh, if you have a storage budget, okay, you can say, well, select whichever indexes you want uh, following these goals, but here's my storage budget, don't go over budget. It can be a storage budget, it can be an index right overhead budget, and so on. Uh, you also can group scans in various groups and give them various priorities. So, for example, if you have a user-facing application, uh, and uh, so a, web app, uh, a set of web app queries that you, you want those to be faster than the rest because it's user-facing, you want fast response time. Well, you can create a group of scans containing the scans related to that, and you can optimize on this specific group of scans first, and then with whatever budget you have left at the end, you can optimize on the rest of the scans. Other things you can do, so you can ignore specific scans. For example, uh, if you have scans that you know are only used in, uh, for debugging purposes or whatever, you can ignore them. Uh, so that they don't impact the solution that you're going to get by the, the solver. So you can just say optimize on this set of scans and ignore the rest. Uh, and one interesting thing you can do is that you can, uh, you can replace existing indexes from your database using this. So if you have a database that doesn't have any indexes, you can use the model to create the initial indexes. Uh, but if you have a database that already has existing indexes, you can do something like, um, I want to add you know, three new indexes. Um, and I want to optimize on this metric, and the model is going to tell you which three indexes you should add in order to optimize on the metrics that you've chosen or on the goals that you've chosen. You can say, um, here's my existing indexes. You can discard up to half of them and try to improve the performance. Now the model is going to give you a solution that keeps at least half of the indexes, and maybe will discard some in favor of others to improve the performance. You can say other things like, uh, I, so there's small, this small subset of existing indexes. I don't want you to touch those. The others you can discard, and then the, the model is going to keep the small set of existing indexes that you already have, and it's going to discard the others. So there's really a bunch of things you can do. It's very flexible whether you have a database that is new and doesn't have any indexes, or if you have something that already has, has <coughs> sorry, indexes and that you're trying to improve. Um, now a quick example of how this works visually so that you have a better idea of, uh, uh, of the way this works behind the hood, under the hood. Uh, so I'll go back to our initial example where we are trying to minimize the costs and minimize the index right overhead. And our first goal is, of course, to minimize the costs. And the second goal is to minimize the index right overhead. Uh, now you see that for the first goal, we've added a strictness parameter of 90%, meaning that whatever we find in the first goal, well, 
when we're going to add that as a rule to the model, uh, the model is allowed to be able to deviate a little bit from that, but not too much. And on the right here, okay, we have uh, a cost matrix. So at the top we have the three scans, and on the side we have four indexes. And if you look at index three and scan one, okay, the eight there indicates that if you choose index three in the solution, scan one is going to get a cost, a cost of eight. And on the left, we have the index right overhead associated with, with every index. So we're solving for the first goal. Okay, we want to minimize the costs. What are the best costs we can get with this? Okay, well, obviously, the best cost we can get is if we look at the uh, matrix uh, column wise, we see that the best cost we can get for every scan is the best cost we can find in every column. So in that, in that case, the best cost we can get for uh, this instance of the problem is a total cost of 10. But this costs us, uh, the penalty of using these indexes is seven index right overhead. Um, now, what we're going to do, remember there's a 90% strictness uh, parameter. So we'll add a rule to the model saying that whichever subsequent solution you give me, you have to ensure that the costs are not worse than 11, because 11 is 90% as good as 10 or 10% worse, whichever way you look at it. Okay, and now the problem becomes, uh, find the smallest index right overhead that will give me costs that are no worse than 11. And now you see that we've chosen, at the present time, we have indexes one, two, and four. Okay, now the model is going to look at this and the solver is going to give us a solution where he switches from index two to index three because we get uh, costs that are slightly worse. Okay, so we went from the four to five. Okay, it's slightly worse, but we went from three in index right overhead to one, which is much better. So we go from a solution of uh, uh, total costs of 10 and seven index right overhead to costs that are slightly higher, but an index right overhead that is uh, uh, fairly smaller. Okay, so this is the way things work uh, under the hood. And whichever number of goals you have or rules and so on, it's always going to be the same principle. Uh, we solve step by step and we rerun the model after having added rules and so on. Um, now, a subset of this is open source and available if you want to play with it. Um, I think I'll let Lucas talk about the rest. We'll show you a bit how it works. All right. Yeah, so if you want to just take a look at the model, this is live right now, as of yesterday. <laughs> um, it essentially represents, I would say, a simplified version of what we've had um, been working on for the last nine months, roughly. Um, this you know, is permissively licensed. We want to you know, have people use it, have people try it. Um, now, the thing that's actually hard with this, though, is actually running it. So what I'm going to show you next is essentially turning this into a, you know, actual, like, I have a Postgres database. How do I feed this model some data? So let's talk about utilizing the index selection model in practice. So in this demo, just as a quick, you know, what we're going to do, we're going to first take a look at some indexes that are just, you know, found by the model. Then we'll say, you know, let's limit that to just one index would give me the best index. And then last, we'll kind of look at this trade-off that Philippe just showed as well um, between the costs and the index right overhead. So I'll try a live demo, and if this doesn't work, I have a backup. But let's see if this works. Um, and hopefully... Yeah, slightly worse than the slides, but hopefully still readable for everyone. Um, so just for context, this is my local machine testing against a local database. Um, you could technically run this against your production database, but for various reasons, I wouldn't recommend that. Um, so right now, the idea here is we want to use our you know, test suite, for example, like our local you know, integration test for application, generate a workload in PG stat statements, and then we want to check if there are any obviously missing indexes based on that. Now, we call this tool PG Analyze Lint. Um, lint for, you know, lint checking, right? Like the idea is you could run this as part of your CI. Um, and then again, it's kind of self-contained, so you could just run this locally. Um, it's essentially a thousand line Rust program. All right, so what I'm doing here is similar arguments to like PG dump of sorts, right? So you get a host, database and such. And then in this case, I'm telling it to check that particular server and then that particular database. Um, fun enough, a table called databases. Um, <laughs> but um, essentially I'm telling it, you know, look at the workload, 
Um, and then what it's doing behind the scenes first is essentially it's looking at that, that statements workload and it's trying to identify everything that relates to that table. And you can actually see what we're doing here um, errors out in some cases. The reason for that is what we're actually doing is a generic explain plan. Postgres 16 has a neat feature called explain generic plan, which makes this easier. So you can actually get explain plans for PG stat statements queries um, that have like dollar one, dollar two replacement characters. And so we use something like that behind the scenes here, but sometimes it doesn't work because of types and such. Um, now what this gives us here in this particular case is it says, well, based on all the queries that we saw on this table and all the scans in particular, um, these are the indexes that are missing. Now, just so you know, I actually deleted these indexes earlier, right? So <laughs> this is right now a table with no indexes, which is why it's recommending us, for example, ID, right? Like that would be a primary key. Usually you would of course have an index there, um, but I just kind of cleared the field um, to have, you know, the output here. Now I'll add one parameter which helps us understand a bit more what's going on. Um, and thanks to the CLI parsing being a bit weird. No. There we go. Has to be before the check. Um, let's see. Um, so just to show you the actual output um, that's produced by the first step where we're doing this, you know, stat statements, generic explain plan, that we're then passing to the model. Um, elevator music. Um, there we go. Um, all right, so the essential we're doing here is, so this here is the input, and then this is a huge JSON field, <laughs> which I'm not going to show you all the details, but essentially imagine this being, you know, a here's the possible indexes, here's all the scans, here's, you know, how, what the costs are for each, the kind of what we talked about earlier. And then what we also do here is we pass in settings. So these settings, um, let me actually scroll up a bit. Um, these settings represent these choices that we make, these kind of settings um, that where we're saying this is how we want the index selection to work. So in this case, what we have right now is we first optimize for minimal cost with a strictness of one um, or one at zero, and then we next we optimize on minimal indexes. If I flip this around, by the way, so if I had minimal indexes first, I would get no indexes recommended because the best solution in terms of minimal indexes is always going to be zero indexes, right? Um, so the order here matters. Now, what I also get after, you know, this essentially is passed to a Python program that actually runs the model. And so afterwards we get this result. And so the result actually tells us um, the, let's scroll up again. Um, so first of all, actually, this is a detail that I'll mention it. Um, everything behind the scenes needs to be an integer. And so what we do here is we actually multiply things by hundred, I think now, um, just to kind of make sure that floats are integers, right? And so this here is actually 6,000.72, just so you know. Um, but the idea is that you first run the minimal cost step, right? And so the best result essentially of that that we see is that 6,000 here. And then next we run the minimal indexes and we get three. Now, at the very end of this output, we can also see some additional statistics. So we're not looking at coverage here, but another way of looking at this problem is saying, which scans are covered by my indexes and can I make sure that I at least have one index on every like column that's being scanned. And so that's kind of the, the initial step here. The next part is essentially telling you, you know, kind of a summary of the costs, like what are the total costs for all the scans, what's the maximum cost that we saw, and then also the indexes that were used in the solution. And then at the end, we see the index right overhead. So we see this solution right now. So we get a cost of 6,000 and we get an index right overhead of 0 0.31 for these three indexes. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna change this. So we have a configuration file here, hopefully that's visible, um, which is a YAML file. Um, feel free to talk to me about why YAML and not JSON. Really, I just like comments, being able to have that um, is useful. Um, but so the idea here is we essentially have a way in our application repository, for example, we can say for this repository, for this application, here is how we want to select indexes. Right? And so right now my configuration is minimal cost first, strictness 1.0, and then minimal indexes. Now I can add a rule. So for example, I can say, give me just one index, right? Like if you can only do one index, which one are you gonna choose? So we'll run things again. And um, this, you know, again, takes a moment. Um, thought about adding some caching, but uh, there was not enough time. Um, <laughs> but the, essentially the, the expensive part here is really doing the um, explain plans um, and the kind of hypothetical indexes. And so, same process, right? But then here at the end now, we just get one index, right? Because we said, only give me one index. And so you can see that obviously the index right overhead is now 0 
versus 0 0.30, right? So it's much lower. Um, but also our you know, total cost went up. So we went from 6,000 to 8,000. Now, how can we actually do better than this? So if we go in here, let's drop this rule out again, and then we change the strictness. So let's change the strictness to 0 0.9, which means, uh, as Philippe was showing earlier, that the first solution, you know, kind of we find the best possible value, and then we say, well, the ultimate solution just needs to be within 9% of that. And so if we run this, um, it will run the same process behind the scenes, right? Everything that's like the input to the model doesn't change, it's just the settings that change here. <clears throat> and so then hopefully, eventually, there we go. All right, so now we got two indexes, um, including our primary key, yay. Um, and so you can see here that this solution that we found at the end had an index uh, total cost of 6,400, right? So it was worse than the best possible, which was 6,000, um, but it's close enough. And what matters more is that the index write overhead went down to 0 0.2, right? And so we got a good trade off here between, you know, like initially it was 0 0.31, right? So we, we essentially shaved off some index write overhead, we got a good enough cost. Um, and to me, that's really why I like this model personally is because it helps me understand what is going on, right? I can actually reason about this um, and it's deterministic also. I can run this again, it's gonna give me the same result. All right, um, let me switch back to the slides. Where are we? There we go. So just to recap what you know that program is doing, right? So we're taking pgstat statements, queries, um, which to me, when I say query workload, I really mean pgstat statements for database. Um, we then do, in this particular case, it's on 15, so it was a variant of this, and 16, I would have used expl explain generic plan, which gives you an explain plan for um, queries that show up in pgstat statements. Then to kind of make this whole process easier to reason about, we turn this into a scan, which is you know, essentially the filter columns on each table. And then we say 40 scans, what are the possible indexes? Then we throw all of that into HyperPG. HyperPG gives us the costs, essentially. And then we say, you know, index selection model, give me a solution. And really the reason why I think, to me, this is also appealing, so I'm originally by trade more of an application developer, and so, to me, what I would like this to eventually become, not saying this is a tape, but like eventually, I want this to be kind of like, you know, I mean, people have opinions about Kubernetes, right? But one of the things that Kubernetes, I think, has done is that there are, you know, ways to define things and we don't log into servers anymore and run individual commands, right? And so I think in a similar sense that we're like being declarative about this is our intent, right? Like we want to be indexing our database like this, um, but we don't necessarily have to do individual create index statements. And ultimately, I hope that that then, you know, gives a better trade-off between application developers and DBAs or, you know, data engineers figuring out which indexes to create. You definitely will go in and change things and overwrite things, right? But I think for a lot of people, when they add new features, this will give them an understanding of how the database is indexed without doing a lot of individual create index statements. And so, you know, in summary, um, our goal here is to semi-automate index selection based on application developer and data team intent. We could also fully automate this, right? So there's no problem with actually creating those indexes automatically. It's just a question if you want that. Um, we want to be able to explain why an index was chosen, right? Like, and if you don't want that index, right, give you a way to override it, give you a way to introspect it. We want to make this configurable. So this shouldn't be, you know, a magic box that, you know, that's AI. Um, instead, it should be a predictable algorithm that you can reason about and understand. And last, um, right now, we focus on checking for missing indexes. But as Philippe mentioned, um, there's you know, other things we could do, like index consolidation, kind of you know, a lot more complex things could be done as well. And just you know, for the Postgres hackers in the audience, um, in case this is interesting to you, um, this is just a laundry list of things that I've run into. Um, I should probably do a patch for at least the very first thing. So these are a couple of details things that, you know, if you're trying to do this in Postgres, what is challenging? So because we're doing generic explain, um, interesting oversight, append notes don't have an alias field. And so what happens, and if you look at verbose explain, you might have something like table name underscore eight, um, and, and you know, there's a partition table, but then the um, append node itself doesn't have an alias, and so you actually, even though that alias shows up in expressions, um, you don't actually know which plan node it refers to. So hopefully that's an easy fix, um, just showing that alias. Second, 
Um, I personally found when I was trying to understand or trying to think how to go about this problem, I found rel opt info, um, the rel opt info struct in the planner quite useful. And in particular, how the planner uses the restrict information, the join info to essentially say, which index am I gonna use, right? Um, because part of what we're doing here is we're doing the inverse of that, right? We're kind of trying to say, what would, what would the best possible thing be here? What do you want to see planner? And so having a way to maybe just have a debug function that says, you know, for this query, um, give me just that information. Um, one of the challenges here, and there's a lot of details to this, right? But like one of the challenges that we didn't touch much upon today is parameterized index scans. So if you have a join um, and you have a nested loop, then uh, in certain cases you can use an index for one side of that join. That is hard to understand for people, and it's also hard to know when that happens. And so this is not necessarily about the index selection problem itself, but it does matter a lot for index selection because if you're picking an index, but then it requires a parameterized index scan, that's you know important to understand. In PGZ statement itself, um, if we're doing this explaining PGZ statements queries, um, it's kind of frustrating when you don't know the search path and you don't know the parameter types um, because planning will often fail because of that, um, especially parameter types. Um, so as we think about if that statement was maybe in shared memory, right, so the query text file would be in shared memory, um, I think there's a question if maybe we should also think about the search path, right, or like how could we kind of make sure that queries are, at least most of the time, planable. And fifth, um, PG qual stats, if you don't know it, is an interesting extension um, that lets you track um, essentially different, different like um, values for expressions, right? So like here, what we're doing is we're essentially saying column equals dollar one, and we're essentially assuming generic selectivity. Um, and obviously, you know, that doesn't always give you good results. Now, PG stat statements doesn't give you actual values, um, but PG qual stats could do some of that. Um, in practice, people don't use it much, but I do think that there is something here about what's the role of selectivity and how do we make sure that, you know, if there's outliers on selectivity um, or partial indexes, for example, how do we kind of capture that information? And then last, um, I think HypoBG is a super important building block, but I think the thing I'm missing is hypothetical in uh, table sizes, right? So could I, especially when I run this locally in a development environment, how can I pretend or have the planner pretend that I have a production size table um, so that the costs are closer to production? And that's really it. Um, thank you so much for you know, being here. And then we'll just switch the microphone and then if there's any questions. All right, wonderful. Uh, question there in front. I'll repeat it also. <laughs> Good question. So the, the question was, could we, um, so as we mentioned, this, like for various reasons, the tool we show is not yet production ready or shouldn't be used in production databases. Now the question was, could we, um, could we utilize production statistics in UAT, right? So if we ran this as part of our test suite um, or as part of manual testing, how could we like transfer those statistics essentially, right? Um, and I think that kind of alludes to the last point I made there at the end, which is like, could we tell the Postgres planner, this is how the statistics look like? I mean, you can kind of insert things into PG stats and such, but like, it feels like there's some missing details in core Postgres to be able to overwrite these. Um, maybe you could write an extension for that. But today I don't know if a good way to pretend that, you know, like you can do indexes, but you can't really do the tables essentially. Um, but any other questions? Um, so the question was, um, PG qual stats already does a lot of the things. Um, what, what do we see missing in PG qual stats, um, if I summarize it correctly? Um, so the, 
I think the way I look at this is like, I don't see people using PG Qualsets that's much in practice, um, which is always the problem with extended strings, right? Like do people actually, you know, run it? Um, and oftentimes, you know, it's you're an Amazon RDS and RDS doesn't support it or something, right? Um, so maybe that's that. Um, to me, it's more a, I, I'll admit, like, I, I don't know why people don't use it, <laughs> um, but I think it um, it could be an ingredient, right? So like here, there's no reason why we couldn't use this part of this model. It would be on the input side, right? So to me, it was more a question of how could we actually get more people to adopt this? Because with PG stat statements, for example, we can see that, you know, people just have that by default. So nowadays, it's really easy to say, what's your query workload? Just check PG stat statements, right? And I feel PG qual sets is not there in terms of usage. Now, I don't know what stands between stat statements and qual sets in that sense. Um, but that to me is what, what I meant essentially was missing is, is really the adoption of it more than you know any particular feature. Uh, the question was, if I got it right, does this work for partition tables? Um, yeah, partition tables are interesting. <laughs> so there is no reason it couldn't work for partition tables, um, but I'll admit it's challenging. So the table I picked was not a partition table um, for the demo. Um, I think the question is how do you reason about costs in a partition table, um, especially when you know partition pruning is involved and such. Um, and so, like technically, this approach would definitely work. It's just a question of what costs do you consider. Um, and again, it's kind of related to the selectivity problem, right? Like how do you make sure that you have a representative kind of pruning that you're looking at? Um, but technically, it would work, right? It's just a question of what is is it actually good measurement, I guess. Um, Sure. So the question was, um, would this work, or like, would this in particular work with multi-column indexes? And yes, of course, you could you could definitely do this with multi-column indexes. Um, if you look at the source of that lint tool, um, again, it's a thousand lines of Rust, so I don't know how much Rust you like, but um, there's a comment in there that says um, generate multi-column index to do. Um, it's the only thing that's missing for that tool right now is just to generate the permutations. Um, really, a multi-column index in this model is just a, is something we cost, right? It's like essentially we're just like we need to generate the index combinations. We need to you know assign the cost using HyperPG, and then we throw it into the mix, and then we get a result. Um, so there's no reason, but multi-column indexes don't work. Um, the one thing that doesn't work well in this whole problem area is gin indexes, because the challenge with gin is because of the inverted nature of them, you can't really do them well in a hypothetical sense, um, and so that's something where. I don't really know what would be a good approach for costing a hypothetical gen index, but that's one of the things that's puzzling me, I think, is more that than multi-column. <laughs> but any other questions? So the question was, um, have we considered doing this daily and then use, like, using that also to, to look at workload changes over time? Um, and so um, we've actually done that. So this part of, just maybe to clarify again, because uh, so we essentially have you know, our application, which is a product you can buy if you want to. Um, and then there's this tool we released today, which is fully open source. Um, now in the PG Analyze application, we actually have a feature that does that, that checks daily. Um, and that works exactly like that. So it, it, there's, and there's no reason you couldn't run this tool daily either, right? So it's, I think the question with you know, daily workload change is what's challenging just in our experience with you know, running this as a product is that um, when your query workload changes, the index costs might change, right? Or like which, which indexes make sense might change. And so that can sometimes be confusing because like the recommendations might change, not because the model is changing, but because the inputs are changing. Um, and so I think that's the challenging part there is like you want it to be a little bit sticky, I guess, right? So that it doesn't change all the time um, and rather kind of keep some permanence um, of the solution. Um, does that answer your question? Perfect. Right, any other questions? Perfect. All right. Well, if you take a look at this, try it out. Um, let us know what you think. Um, and thank you so much for joining us this morning.